All right, day three, VMware Explore Barcelona, and today we've actually got a vSAN ESA customer, John. You know, it's uh, it's kind of catching on, Pete. It is, it is, absolutely, yeah. And I'm getting ready to absolutely destroy his name, but Johannes, uh, <laughs> welcome to the podcast. Thank you. That's, I didn't even want to try your last name. <laughs> that's absolutely, Johannes was absolutely fine. Thank you for having me. So yeah, tell us a little bit about your company, first and foremost. Yeah, I'm working for Rodeon Schwarz. Uh, we're based, uh, or the main hub is based in Munich, uh, and we're internationally sitting pretty much in every country, and uh, doing high-tech stuff from uh, let's say military radios over to um, measuring equipment for mobile radio communication services, um, radio location, um, and some media stuff, some cybersecurity stuff, and um, maybe the the most important product that you, as a usual customer, would see is the body scanner at the airport. Ah. So we have the body scanner that's like the one where you have the hands down. Ah. This is the footage one. one. Not the one where I have to put my hands up. This is the competitor. Oh, I don't like that one. <laughs> I think I went through that in Munich on the way yep. here. So. so Munich is completely <laughs> equipped and uh, pretty much all the European airports. It uh, looks so futuristic. Like It is AI at the edge. So there is uh, machine learning or AI happening right in the scanner. What, 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 what is the AI? What is it doing? So it's the, uh, essentially it's taken a microwave image of your your body so it goes through everything that's um, not skin yeah. <laughs> and would see uh, taken essentially a picture and then applies a machine learning model whether this is a normal body picture or if there's something suspicious sure. and then we'll mark it on the screen for the security guards well pete nice. looks suspicious and is not normal <laughs> so that's uh yeah that's sometimes they will just force that. you to, to walk away <laughs> <laughs> very nice very nice so uh before we dive into esa um what's your what's your background with uh, vsan in general yeah so um we have been trying osa with uh, 6.5, I think we started, and it wasn't really working for us quite well. We had, I think, two or three deployments. Um, for smaller sites, that was okay, uh, but we never really invest, invested in it. For the smaller parts, it was just cheaper going with the traditional SaaS based solution for two nodes or whatever. And um, yeah, that's pretty much the, the background there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to 6.5, was that? Did we have deduplication back then? I can't even remember. That was, it was kind of there, but uh, there was some performance, there's been a lot of performance improvements since then. The other thing is this is back in the days of multicast, so setup was a bit more complex. Yeah. It was, uh, th there was not near quite, um, you know, it was a car, but it wasn't a Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily and for it was surrounded by a lot of Porsches that were like, come over here, drive us. That's it, yeah. <laughs> and the other ones were kind of cheaper, easier to use in that back in the day, so. Um, Luckily, the, the, the situations where we deployed vSound back then was really like low I.O., no latency requirements really. It's just keeping a site up running with local software deployment and stuff like that. So yeah. it really doesn't matter. So, you know, con contrasting that, how has ESA been just general impressions from a easy use, performance? Yeah, so I think the, one of the great things is really avoiding a caching tier. Yep. Just yeah. going all in with all high performance devices, going NVMe all in. I, I can remember having the chats on OSA, like, why wouldn't you just go NVMe straight? And this was pretty much um, two years ago, I think, when we talked about that. Um, and from, from, the, from the user perspective, it doesn't really change. It's just picking different, or the, the selecting media or claiming disks uh, yeah, is yeah. just a different wizard, and then off you go. It looks exactly the same, there is no real difference. And that makes it super easy to adopt. So yeah, no extensive retraining there. Um, but I'm sure there was some like if we are doing a full contrast with the OSA, there's at least a little bit of uh, consideration into how do I want to design yeah. my disk groups and and uh, you know and do I have you know like and how do I define my caching devices yeah. and all that stuff. So a lot more to consider and Definitely. potentially actually do wrong, right? Yeah. 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 And especially for those small deployments, you probably, or we ended up with just one disk group because two disk groups were way too expensive and we don't need the capacity. So um, this was another problem. While the performance isn't getting any better with just one disk group, so there was, sure. let's say, limitations. Additional you know, failure handling and other yeah. things, yeah. particularly those two nodes, being able to do, if you're doing the two node cluster, being able to do RAID within the host yeah. um, is a lot more practical with Definitely. ESA. You yeah. had to start with three disk groups yeah. with OSA, yeah. which really made it a non-starter for a lot of people. And actually, we, we are still running an OSA cluster that's, I think, 12 nodes, um, but we already increased the capacity with NVMe-only nodes, and now migrating off some of the 
nodes out of that OSA cluster, just setting aside an ESA. Now we have vSphere 8. Um, and we already knew that this NVMe only is, is the requirement for, for ESA. Uh, so you bought the nodes with the ESA set. in so mind. So Obviously there were no ESA ready nodes and we're not really taking care of the, the green light that's, that has Well, has but you've got the there. emulated ready node. Pete's got the blog. Yeah. You, you can do that now. And this so. is a good thing, really having the, the ready node profiles changing and being way more open because then we can pretty much do everything. So back then, the, the, the environment is just having a 10 gig switch, but we already have 25 gig NICs. Yeah, so you're but ready still, to go 10 forward. 10 gig is fine for us because bandwidth requirements is not that bad, but latency in this case is super important. So ESA is helping even with a 10 gig interface. Interesting. So what are what are some of the applications you're running on this, you know, or platform? So this specific environment is, is Kubernetes. Oh, um, So okay. there is actually OpenShift running on top. Oh, nice. fun. And we're currently, identifying how we can migrate the PVCs that are still on OSA <laughs> over to ESA. I just learned this week that there is a migration way in Update 2. Yep, and yep. I, as I said, I, <laughs> I screwed up the Update 2 upgrade, so uh, we'll, we'll have to see on how well this works. <laughs> but, uh, I, no, it'll be, it'll be good. So going forward, though, um, it sounds like you've got, you know, a, f a full on development environment running there. You're using the persistent volume disk, so you're using the CSI integration yep. to summon volumes on that. So this is not just, oh, we've got, you know, six VMs or something. You yeah, that's a couple more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fun. But the so, interesting part, there is a, the zone concept in OpenShift, and we're adopting zones and add them to the ESA and OSA vSAN data store, where we now can have a PVC uh, or a storage class, essentially, that's that's taking the zone availability of that storage. Ah, uh, uh, so at the Kubernetes level in the YAML, the they Kubernetes can specify level. that yeah. in the zone yeah. and say, I want this availability yeah. placement and this is and map how, we, that how we do the migration. Oh, that's fun. It's, so let's say not not the way it was intended to, but it's right. working for no, us. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I'm sure, like obviously, you go into you know the the ESA. I'm sure you didn't just do that first try. Was there any level of proof of concept? Like, did you say, well, let me see how this works and, yeah. and how did and, and and what was that about? Luckily, we we got a bunch of uh, Gen 11 HP hosts in that case. They had uh, two NVMe's in it, and we just tested with it. Um, and playing around, and on the other hand, there is multiple OpenShift clusters running, So, and one is just the play around one, and we deploy the new one, and this is one of the cool things. Some people have test, yeah, yeah, Kubernetes clusters, yeah. some people it's production, but for you, yeah. you've got a separate <laughs> one. So. Yeah, and we can deploy, really, we redeployed a new one from scratch where we tried this zonal uh, concept inside because we were not sure on how things would change on the production cluster when you just introduce this zonal concept in storage. So. That, but then we did the testing and said, hey, this is super straightforward because you can't really screw up. There's just another storage class um, that you have to define with the, with the zone in it, and then off you go. Oh, okay. So it sounds like simplicity was a big part of it. Were there any uh, benchmarking comparisons between the OSA and the ESA, or was it just faster? <laughs> just anecdotal, <laughs> like, yeah, what's the first? It is essentially really that our monitoring application, so keeping, or it's logging and monitoring stack that runs on top of on OSA, and they had the most complaints about performance because uh. the, the ingesting logs was, at some point when there were too much logs, the latency got too high, and they mm. were just stuck in the end. Um, and when we just migrated them over, there was an easy migration because they have the data copied, I think, three times, so we could just add another copy and, and throw the other one away. And since then, they never had an issue again. And Is that like a NoSQL ingestion system or just a... Don't ask me. So those are... Log, yeah, log people are weird. <laughs> log people are weird. Fair enough. Fair enough. I like it. So so you, you basically use ESA and you became the hero of the organization? That's it. I like it. I like it. <laughs> no, it's, but that's fun because the application, like you say, it's one of those one of those scale out log ingestion platforms yeah. or something where it's running three instances. Like, okay, let's move one over to the ESA cluster, see how it performs. Oh, wow, yeah. latency's down. Yeah. Let's, yes, yeah, so let's yeah. keep pulling them over, so. And nice. it was it, it was really like, we migrated the, the first one over and, and the folks were like, ah, let's, let's keep it running for some days and look how it performs. Yeah, yeah. And after the migration, they, they saw the, the, the increase in performance for that node that they decided, ah, let's do the secondary node overnight because it was yeah, yeah. At nighttime already, and they were so convinced that we at the next day migrated the third node as well. So no, nice. slowly walk it over and uh, really helping them um, by a lot. Yeah. Well, and those those log platforms, if your storage latencies are high, it's really annoying. Because when you run queries, yeah. um, 
my experience working with yeah. some of the stuff that have Cassandra and other stuff in the back end, it's like trying to trying to run that. You run your query and it's like, okay, why am I waiting? I'm waiting 45 seconds. I'm impatient. I'm used to Google. Yeah. Like, and <laughs> you know, you're running, you know, potentially something against an unindexed data set or yeah. things like that. It can take a while, but uh, it always feels so nice when you just hit search and things yeah. go instantly. It's, and they, uh, they also also have their metrics in, in a Grafana uh, instance, ingesting the same uh, route. And it's really like, when you want to look on how my application is performing and you have to wait, as you said, 45 seconds a minute for your graphs to show up, it, it's not no fun. Yeah. Well, and you, yeah, sometimes people will try to hack around that by the, the white and the pole frequency yeah. Yeah. and do that, but now you don't have the same fidelity of data. And so if you can drive down the latency to those monitoring applications, you can sometimes even increase how frequently you pull, Definitely. you get better visibility. Because um, when users are complaining about stuff, it's often like short bursts, so yeah. that's, those systems can generate a lot of data. That's fun. That is fun. And this is really what we've done also, or what we've seen with our VDI environment. So we, we started migrating over VDI from a traditional uh, fiber channel based array to a 28 node ESA cluster now. Uh, and the primary effect was read latency dropped dramatically. And this is where the user sees, hey, I'm clicking and trying to open a binary, whatever, and right. it's instantly open. Instead of waiting, even if it's only sub seconds, whatever, yeah, it's they still, add up. <laughs> user no, experience it's, it's, is, is, um, is improving there by, by a lot. It, it's interesting because just what was acceptable with spinning drives is no longer. Yeah. You know, I think I remember reading a TechNet article with Microsoft saying like, hey, that Outlook OST cache, it needs to be on SSD and fast SSD or expect random stuttering in Outlook. Like, we've gone to the point where the expectations of applications for storage performance have increased and they've set, you know, what previously would have been viewed as hilariously unrealistic expectations on end users uh, to get work done, and yeah, you know, it's well, any. We're in a generation, John, where these, where these kids did not even have to use AOL dial-up, you know, to get hey. on the internet. So, <laughs> you know, they expect this stuff now. <laughs> yeah. But everybody's running around with a laptop with an NVMe media in That's it. It's exactly super right, fast, yeah. and this is mm -hmm. what, how you or yeah, your you iPhone can probably to. do sixty thousand IOPS. So, right. you know, there's it's we're. Yeah. The mobile mobile computing is definitely yeah, that is a new that. normal yeah. for sure. So VMware Explorer has been here all week. I'm sure you've been uh, attending some sessions and uh, and watching the general sessions and stuff like that. I'm curious, what's your takeaway from this week? Um, so what was really great for me to see is that AI is also picking up pace uh, because what we are doing with AI already in our company is driving for five years already, and we pretty much hacked around all the all the different AI aspects and trying to get, get a hold on hardware, but seeing VMware really evolving and also partnering uh, with different providers on the, on the AI market, and especially with the open source community, really helps our developers in the end bring the next body scanner product to the market. Yeah. And you know, I actually re now remember when I, I, I came through Munich on the way here, and I had some, normally, you know, I'm like, okay, I've been with these things, I'm like, let me get all the metal out or whatever. I had like three $20 bills in my right pocket, and it picked it off. And I was like, really? They're that good? <laughs> He's like, something's in your right pocket. I'm like, okay, here's, here's, here's my cash. But uh, yeah, no, no, no. It's uh, the fidelity yeah, you know. of, uh, of applications is getting too good. You're going to have to actually clean out your pocket speed. <laughs> and powered by vSense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And powered by vSense. I like it. I love it. I love it. Well, Johannes, thank you so much for joining us on Virtually Speaking, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your week at Explore. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the chance here. All right. <laughs>